Hello again. Um, my name is Karen Kiefer, and I recognize many of you in this room, but I'm the director of the Church in the 21st Century Center here at Boston College. And we are so excited about this evening. Um, many of you that have followed along um, with our programming um, know that for the past year, actually starting last November, we began a series called Revitalizing Our Church. This is the fifth program in that series, and many of you might have also realized our magazine that came out revitalizing our church. If, in fact, you don't have a copy of it, we have plenty of copies out in the lobby, um, and we also have a supplemental version of the magazine um, that's here, and again, it's out um, on the table. Um, th for this fifth program, we wanted to have a special focus on young people, because you're the future of the church. Um, and we also wanted to focus in on innovators and ideas, because ideas change things. Conversation changes things. And tonight, we have some change makers with us um, to have a conversation about what they've done, what they're doing, what they hope to do, um, and then I want to open it up to you so that you can ask questions. And you know, I think sometimes we go along in our lives and we think we have to follow this path and that path and, or somehow I can't um, marry my interest in my faith or my church with my career and, and my uh, business trajectory and they've simply defied that. Um, and tonight we're going to learn how they found their path um, and hopefully can help you, um, especially the students here, um, think about your future path and the possibilities that await you. So um, the three innovators are Miss Molly Ms. <laughs> Mo and Molly's from Goodlands. And then we also have Miss Nell and Mr. Marcelino. Um, you have their bios, we have the one sheeter, so you can take a look at those. We don't wanna spend too much time telling you everything that they've done because we wanna jump right into the conversation. Um, so let's begin with you, Molly. Um, I found it fascinating uh, picking up Forbes magazine and having them um, write a headline piece on you and you, you probably know this, it said, can this lay woman transform the way the Catholic Church manages its land? Short answer, yes. <laughs> and you're doing it, and it's remarkable. And I wanna do a deep dive into how you thought to do it, how you are doing it, and the challenges that you're meeting. Um, and then I'm gonna talk to Nell and Nell's gonna tell us about Blessed Is She, and we're gonna dig deep into that. And then we're gonna talk to Marcelino, who will dig deep into his um, cre um, Creative Catholics Project, and uh, Catholic Creatives Project. Before I get into conversation with you, Molly, I just wanna show this really cool video um, that we found on YouTube um, about you, and I thought it would be a great way to open. Go, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> Molly, so did you just wake up one day and say, oh, I want to do this. I want to found Goodlands. How did it all happen? It's interesting. Um, and if we go into a deep dive and I don't stop talking, please feel free to cut me off. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, it was much more like a kind of tsunami of everything that I had learned in my life and all of my skills. There was no eureka moment for it. And I've had eureka moments about things in my life before, and they're fun and exciting, but this was just very organic. Um, I was discerning religious life, or actually just talking about this, um, with some Benedictines. And um, I was also co-founding my first company at the time, which is still operating. It's a worker-owned uh, vertical farm providing fresh food year-round in Buffalo. So you're an entrepreneur at heart? Yes. Yeah, I just like getting stuff done. I think that's that's really like I Love like it. seeing stuff happen a lot. We and need that. Yeah, <laughs> and it's really amazing once you start something to see that you can continue to start things, and it's a challenge. It's very challenging. It's not an easy path. 
Um, but I saw that these nuns were just doing the most inspiring work. You know, they were getting rival gang members to break bread together. And everything about what they did was fantastic, except I saw that their property management could have used improvement. You know, they had acres of mown lawn. They had forests that could have been sustainably managed in a way that improved ecosystems health and brought them a source of revenue. Um, they had donated properties that were used for like AA once a week and to store diapers while, you know, youth groups couldn't find a place to meet. So it was kind of like, well, you know, this is an information problem that we're having here. We don't understand what we even own and we don't understand how to manage it. So that's really where it got started. And I, um, I actually, my senior year, I was choosing between this little graduate school I found in Ma Western Massachusetts, which is such an interesting place. It's the only school I applied to because I was just enamored by it. It's called the Conway School. And, um, and going to Rome, I'd actually been invited to work with a Jesuit artist, Ru Father Rupnik in Rome, um, by one of the Jesuits I knew in school, and I said, maybe I'm too focused on social justice and doing things. What if I'm supposed to be a contemplative? And um, I turned down going to Rome, and I decided to go to this little school no one had heard about because I was so, um, discernment was a huge part of it. You know, Ignatian discernment has been a huge part of my life. I just couldn't stop focusing on, you know, the soil we walk upon, upon uh, about the land of the church. And what I didn't expect on this journey was that um, the more I looked and the more I called dioceses about their property records and the more I tried to find where I would go work when I graduated with the people doing all this, the more I was met with no one was doing it. And uh, that was... How much land there was. Yes. And um, it says one, one landholder. It's actually, it's a collection. It's a network of land holdings. There are many different legal structures. Um, depending on where you are in the world, some diocese, the bishop is the sole, sole proprietor. Some diocese, it's many little LLCs. It really, I'm not going to go there. But, um, you know, collectively, we do own a tremendous amount of land. And that land is a multiplier of every single mission we have, whether it's feeding the hungry. That food has to come from somewhere, whether it's, you know, clothing the naked. That clothing comes from a resource that comes from land. Everything that we do touches land, and we have to realize that stewarding that land isn't just stewarding the earth and God's creation. It's also loving our neighbors. It's loving our neighbors downstream from us that are impacted by that land management, and it's loving each other. And the only way you can do that in a scientifically informed way is really by using maps. That's the tool that we use to understand land and the tool that we use to create blueprints to manage it in a holistic way. So walk us through mapping technology. Like what, what is it? It's Other than the, you know, I understand GPS, but I mean, when you're trying to do that for land around the world, I mean, it's not like you said, let's just focus on Massachusetts, right? Yeah. So um, <laughs> there are so many different levels of nerd I could go with this, so I'm going to try to keep it basic. <laughs> so um, imagine you're looking at, your, at Boston College from above. Um, from Google Earth, let's say. And now try to identify things. You can identify buildings. You can identify their names. You can identify trees. All of these are what we call kind of different features on a map. You can map a building. And now that name of that building is another kind of data set. And you can have a data class of your building names. And then you can have a data class of vegetation. And how powerful technology is now is that we can actually pull out individual species in acres of land um, with a margin of error. It's still not perfect, but it's getting there um, using satellite imagery. For the United States, we have topographic data at less than one foot resolution, so very fine for the entire United States. I mean, that's critical information that tells us about solar radiation, you know, um, erosion potential, and you combine that with vegetation. So there's all these different pieces of information. You layer that on also with marketing data. How much is the property worth? What's the risk of it for taxation, which is a big concern in the church? Um, you know, what's the climate change impact going to be on it with sea level rise? Um, all of this information, so it's kind of like you can sandwich it on, you can pull it apart, and um, scientists have just created massive libraries. I mean, MassGIS, if you really want to get into this, has a ton of free stuff and a great platform you can look at um, with like soil types even or, or geology. And this, this indicates you know, what you can plant in a place even. I mean, most people, they think, oh, Ladato Si, I'll put a rain garden here and plant something here. But the reality is um, where we put our environmental programs needs to be environmentally informed. Um, and we saw that that wasn't being done. And um, you know, one of the, probably the most expensive 
actually, and resource intensive part of our work is just getting records in order. Right, yeah. So once we do that, it's like we might as well not just look at where you should put your rain garden or your solar panels or your tree planting, but also what, how can we help communities with better financial real asset management? Or how can we help them strategize about you know, homelessness and social impact programs too? So that baseline data really drives everything we do and everything that people request from us. I'm curious, how did you get the church to listen or to, to wake up to what was available to them? Like how did you get inside the Vatican? divine intervention yes I believe it <laughs> yeah um, I mean it's one thing to like have all this knowledge and mapping and technology but it's another thing to like say hello I'm here I have no idea actually when I I was invited to speak at a Catholic relief services conference and I had no money when I found a good lens I shouldn't say no I had seven thousand dollars saved leftover student loans um and I uh I was, uh, Catholic Relief Services flew me out to Nairobi to speak about just the idea, and I took that flight to Rome, and I stayed in a youth hostel while we were doing our first big mapping project for a religious order, and um, we were doing that for free. All of our work we started doing for free because everyone was like, this sounds interesting, but we don't really get it, so it started really with a lot of... It's, it's complicated. It is, it is, and people are still getting it, but they're really getting it now, which is really exciting. Um, a lot more people are, and approaching us with their own projects rather than us begging to do stuff for free, <laughs> which is really nice. But yeah, I, I just happened to reach out to, you know, Cardinal Turkson and the Secretary of State. I said, you know, I could really use this diocesan boundary data set and it's nowhere. And, uh, you know, I happen to have the best cartography team in the world donated to me at my fingertips. If we don't have it, can I come talk to you? Are there security reasons? And I think I think one of the things that's been helpful is I've been very open yeah. with the Vatican and with the Secretary of State and with everyone about my intentions for this. Um, what we're dealing with is the most financially valuable asset of the Catholic Church, and not knowing what we have is a big issue. Um, but you know, making sure that that's being analyzed and approached in a way that's consistent with the mission of the Church mm -hmm. and the intentions of us, and also future generations where that land <coughs> will be a legacy has been imperative. Um, I've communicated with the Secretary of State, I actually just got back from Rome, consistently about what we've discovered in our data, um, not you know the nitty gritty stuff, but things like the Vatican still having Kosovo and having zero geographic standards and their global maps. I mean, this is, this is a big issue for Christians geopolitically, the fact that the Holy See has done nothing in the mapping department pretty much since the Holy Roman Empire. So we're just, you know, kind of ended up breaking all this digital ground <laughs> that no one expected. But then there's this, in a beautiful way, there's this kind of underlying trust. Like they, they, they trust you. Either trust right or are scared yeah, <laughs> of our right, data. I'm not right. sure. Maybe a, maybe a little maybe a little bit of both. Um, I, I be, before we get to to Nell, um, I I just want to ask you one more question. The three of you are doing a beautiful job, like building community and what you do and consensus, um, and that's what we need. Can you just speak for just a few minutes, Molly, about your community? of like the students from Yale and jo your relationship with Georgetown and like how you're just building what you, you guys would call your tribe. Yeah, it's that also has been quite um, organic, I would say. I was never really an aggressive networker. It's not really in my blood to even look at people that way. It seems kind of usury. And so it's just, you just meet these people and you click and you share a vision. And it's a really beautiful thing. And I was surprised at Georgetown the first time I met with their president that they immediately entered into an MOU with us. So that's our only like official official um, partnership. But we do have, I work with the students at Yale in the forestry department and um, have just a phenomenal network of, of mentors um, from within the church and business. And um, this community is necessary. I mean, no one is a solopreneur. Um, it's a really hard job and you mess up a lot. And um, having people that have walked at least part of that path before alongside you to share their wisdom is, it would be impossible um, without that. So it's something I'm, I'm grateful for that's, you know, just absolutely a, a, a blessing in my life, both professionally for its development, but also personally and spiritually. Um, I would say all of these people have really, really made me better. 
Mm. And also there's an excitement to not really knowing where you're going next in a beautiful way, right? <laughs> um, you're being led. Yeah. Um, aren't we all? Yeah. You know, we just have to be open to that. Um, let's go to Nell. Nell. Hi, I'm friends. Nell O'Leary um, from Blessed Is She. I, I, I do want to say, too, um, Molly just came back from Europe, and Nell just flew in from Minneapolis, and Marcelino flew in from Dallas just to be with us tonight, which is just so great. And they've never met each other, which is even more wonderful. Um, but tell us a little bit about Blessed Is She. I'm a member, um, Northeast region, um, and I love what you're doing. Well, Blessed Is She, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a Catholic women's ministry. So we started online, but our goal is for people to meet together for prayer and community. Not to exclude the gentlemen. It is for ladies. It is for women. So Blessed Is She was founded in 2014 by my dear friend Jenna Gizar, whom I did not know at the time. And Jenna was a mom working full time as a respiratory therapist who just saw her Protestant friends having so many ways to connect with each other over scripture. And none of her Catholic friends were doing it. So kind of like you said, Molly, she looked around and thought, well, surely there has to be something for Catholic women that's aesthetically pleasing, that's community oriented, that'll help us go deeper in the word in our faith tradition. She's looking and she's looking. It's not there. So she'd been blogging about motherhood and other things, and she reached out in this blogging group that someone else had added me to and said, you know, ladies, uh, you're, you know, a number of you are writers, and I'm just wondering if anyone wants to join me. I want to start something. I want to start something for Catholic women where we could, we could send out a free email every day where we look over, you know, the, the mass readings are in there, and it's just a reflection of devotion, stories from our lives about how the Lord is working in our lives. And I was like, Sign me up. So I'm an attorney. I was the managing editor of Law Review back in the day. And I'd been at home with my kiddos for a while. And my brain was getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And I also but your had, heart was getting bigger and My bigger heart was and getting bigger. bigger and bigger. My arms were getting stronger from carrying them around. Uh, my kiddos are close in age. I have four kids uh, born in six years. So uh, rock on. Well. And I'm away from all of them. This is a vacation, you guys. This is a vacation. So Jenny Gieser put out this call and said, who, who wants to be part of it? And I said, this is an answer to a prayer in my heart, Lord, to use my gifts and talents to give you greater glory and to be part of authentic Catholic sisterhood. An authentic sisterhood where we can lay down the pretenses and the defenses and the charades and the social media filters and truly be with each other on this journey of our faith. Because it's kind of a lonely journey. I think those, those first 20 women who started to write, many of them had, they were in the workforce, but they didn't have any Catholic friends in the workforce. They were at home with a kid or two or 10. They, you know, they didn't have community. They were kind of trapped in their homes, staring at their phones in the bathroom alone for five minutes of adult interaction that may have been me. They were women who were, you know, exploring their vocations, who were living out their single life with joy and celebration, but lacking the, the ability to come together in a way surrounding our faith, but in authentic sisterhood. So that was five years ago, and Blessed She has changed my life so much. It's affected my spiritual growth. I thought I'd be out there, like, editing, you know, we have 40 writers now, you know, correcting their grammar. You guys, it's transformed me. And part of sharing about Blessed Is She and sharing about the sisterhood, it's for other women to know all ages and stages, we are not alone in this journey. I mean, we have a triune God. We're made for relationship, right? He's got Father, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We've got to have each other to help grow and go deeper in our faith. You know, the thing that I'm impressed about the, the, with Blessed Is She is that it's a digital platform online and yet you do so much to create community offline and I thought it was when I first you know maybe two years ago I started doing a deep dive on the website and I was like this is brilliant they've actually taken the United States and turned it into regions and then formed smaller communities like I'm a member of the northeast region but then there's smaller communities that you can come together and have a blessed is she brunch or you can go to a retreat 
and then very active is your social um, media um, as well as the daily devotional that you can get. Every, I wake up to it every day. But I, it, it really is remarkable um, because that's what I think our church needs to do better is build communities not only online but offline and do it in a way that's fun and welcoming and, um, and is contagious. I think that when the Holy Spirit is moving in us, we're able to love each other, and that contagion just spreads. That joy for the faith just spreads. So like you said, Karen, we have regional Facebook groups. Uh, I'm an admin for all of them, so I get to see the incredible array of graces, the people, hundreds of people praying for each other, meeting each other, answering questions somebody's in RCIA, answering questions somebody's struggling with this church teaching, there for each other to be with each other. And then our daily devotional emails, our, our writers span from college to grandma and everything in between. We have one of our writers here tonight, Sister Maria Kim. So I was like, we've got a sister on our team, you guys. We've got a sister who writes for us. So to see their, their, um, their devotional writing, our small group guides, our studies, we really try to hone in on meeting women where they are because we're an evangelizing ministry. We're here to open the doors open and invite people in. Bring a sister. Bring a sister with you to mass. Bring a sister with you to small group. Bring a sister with you to confession. Um, we're not, you know, we're not specifically catechizing. We're not specifically there to teach and to go deeper into the truths of our faith. We point to other directions for that, the catechism, you know, your local priest. But it, it is beautiful to say that, you know, Jenna Giza's heart and mine working alongside her all these years is for women to come together and to know each other and to be known and to know how beautifully they are made and how lovably they are for each other and those relationships to spur on going deeper in our faith. You know, the, the website itself, too, if you haven't visited the website, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's simply beautiful. I had read an article about a year ago where Jenna was talking about the tension that she had in starting Blessed Is She um, and then knowing she needed money. Um, because the website costs money, and then to grow costs money, and then she was working as a respiratory therapist, and she had four kids, and like these, w what do you call them, side hustles, are expensive. Um, and talk a little bit about the journals and about how you got to the point where you realized you needed to sell some things online to make money, and then I know Jenna said she was getting a lot of pushback from people saying you try to make making money from God off of God. But um, money's an issue. Well, We're going to talk about that in a minute. And I think, you know, when people are looking to innovate and looking to start something, there are always these leaps of faith. You know, for Jenna, it's a family business. It's out of her home. Her husband runs the shipping. It's very homegrown in that respect, despite the fact the website's gorgeous and we have these big social media platforms. It, it really is at her heart. It's for her home and her family. So when it, when it started, everybody was volunteer, all the writers, Jenna ran the website herself, you know, in between like intubating patients, she'd be like in the stairwell texting. Um, so it has grown with the beauty of being able to provide gorgeous products for women that aren't just like hokey swag. It's stuff like an avid and Christmas journal we have this year. It's stuff like these small group studies. So there are things that we have that are paid for, and those pay for the rest of the things to be free. The majority of Blessed She's offerings are free. The gatherings, the devotionals, the Teachable Tuesdays. But to be able to say, you know, when you're thinking about how do I, how do I marry what I love to do with also being able to provide an income for myself or for my family, to be able to figure out what is quality and authentic that I can share at a fair price. It's beautifully designed and, you know, Printed right here in the U.S. How, what what can I do that would do that? That would actually be able to in turn be able to pay the writers, you know, pay the social media help, you know, pay the designers, pay for those things, because it's it's you know it, it's a reality. It, they are beautiful. As a matter of fact, leading up to Advent, we'll be giving away a couple of the journals online. So watch us, uh, you know, stay tuned on Facebook for that. But yeah, they're they're beautiful, and I think we're going to talk in a few minutes about growth and expansion, but. Um, I want to get to Marcelina, and um, I want to talk about what you and your brother are doing with Catholic Creatives and basically giving artists and people with great ideas and great imagination like a platform to express themselves to make the world and our church a better place. Like, bravo. Check. 
Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about your beginnings, how it all started, because you certainly yeah. didn't say this is what I'm doing. It just so uh, when I was in high school, my brother and I uh, started. Twins. Yeah, my twin brother and I were identical. One of us. Uh, yeah, you don't know actually which one of us is here right now. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, a couple weeks. Hi, ago, Anthony. <laughs> A couple weeks ago, like something came up, and one of us was supposed to go on a trip, very much like this one, uh, to Detroit, and uh, he he had to he had to back out of it. So I took his ID and I went on the plane, and I just did the event for him. No one knew. <laughs> <laughs> Got a lot of stories about that. We didn't talk about those later. But anyway, um, when we were in high Who school, are you? <laughs> I am Marchlino. Um, but yeah, so when I was in high school. My brother and I started a pop punk band in lieu of the, uh, you know, skinny jeans and the, like, emo, emo hair, kind of those days before, like, tight jeans were socially acceptable. And uh, that was, like, I mean, for me, I found my tribe in the punk rock scene. And what I saw there that was, like, so different, I mean, going to a rock show at that point was, like, it was a religious experience. And it was powerful on a level to me that was almost like, I mean, it was, it was uh, before I really experienced my faith com coming alive, like, it was, it was similar to that, and I went through, you know, like, a, a conversion experience, I gave my life to God, um, I ended up putting down music and going to seminary, and uh, I thought that, you know, like, God wasn't going to call me to pick that, that back up, but throughout the time of, of seminary, and then, like, going into ministry after, I went to, um, I went and I became a youth minister after uh, after college, and it was just such a, like, the, the experience that I had there was, like, I was trying to all, always, like, bring new ideas to the forefront at the parish, but you know, we would always come, like, come up against these walls and these barriers that were, like, this isn't how we've always done this, you know, like, maybe we should use not Comic Sans on the flyer at this time, um, <laughs> just throwing that out there. But like just the culture of the church was so suffocating to anything that was like new ideas or, or yeah, just innovation in general. And so I just started kind of like finding my way out of church circles because it was so suffocating. Like I was just getting so beaten down after like these years of just trying to come up with new things for for the church and not not being able to actually like do them. And so I went to this uh, this meetup. I was starting to get into like the marketing world, to the tech world in Dallas. And there was this meetup that was like uh, all these architects, these like millennial architects and designers, rented out this space that was like a old like warehouse space in downtown Dallas, and uh, they threw up maps. To your point, uh, of the of of the Dallas city, and they just started talking about like what like the social problems were in the city. Everybody got like a handful of like post-it notes. There was a keg. And we were all just like ta putting up post-it notes, talking about like dreaming about the, the, like what the city could look like. And I had this just like kind of, I was torn inside. I was like, this is amazing. And then at the same time, I was like, there's no way that this could ever have any impact. This is such millennial BS, you know, like God. So I was like, I was having this kind of like cynicism inside of me. And I was like, that is why nothing is happening in the church. Like, we, we hit these barriers, we come up out of this time of like, I don't know, maybe you're in college, you guys have big dreams, you go out, you like get no to like five, five ideas that you throw out there and then you just shut down and you get like frustrated. And that's, that's the end of it. And for me it was like, that's happening. I need to do something about this. If I don't wanna stay in this like place of cynicism I need to do something. And so I was like, I'm just going to invite a bunch of my friends that I know that would be interested in something like this to a um, to my friend's house. We're going to decorate it like super cool. Everybody bring an ugly church bulletin. We're going to do like a Google style design sprint on this thing. <laughs> and it was sick, man. Like people drove from like everywhere for it. It was like finally all these people were like, you want to hear what I have to say about the bulletin? You know, so I didn't intend to start an organization, but we started a Facebook group to, like, involve people that couldn't come in the conversation. It just started this whole, whole like, 
this whole community, this organization, all of a sudden, like, I had to figure out what to do with it. You know, so that was really the inception point. Since then, we've been, like, putting on, um, well, actually, we'll talk about this in, in, a, in a bit, but one of our dreams is to, like, just create a platform and a place for creatives, for innovators, for entrepreneurs to come together, to ideate together, to, like, meet with investors, to, like, just have a home and a space for ideation. You know, so that's, that's pretty much what Catholic Creatives is, and uh, we'll talk, I guess, a little more about that later. But you yeah. know, it's fascinating between the three of you. Everything started because you were thirsty or like, like wanting something, seeing a need and just wanting to fill it. And like you just jumped and, and did it. And that's what I think all of us need to do more, right? We just have to fill, fill the void. It's like just do it. Just do it. You know, you can't fail. You can't fail. But it's hard and it's challenging. Um, I, I want to talk about um, the innovation challenge. Yeah. Um, and we can show the video, and then I want to bounce to Nell and, and talk about, I just want to share a video about the retreat. And then I want to get into, like, the challenges of making an idea happen yeah. um, and, and not feeling, like, beaten down and then trying to figure out how to move forward, you know, in the next five years. What does that look like? So let's take a quick look at, at this um, Innovator Challenge, and then yeah. you can speak to that, because I know that that's like kind of the next big oh, thing for you. Saints. So we, we started Catholic Creatives with that like design challenge meetup where we like brought a bunch of people together with this idea that like everyone that is Catholic, I mean, honestly, if we look at the first five words of scripture, it's in the beginning, God created. Our, our identity as, uh, as human beings is to create. It's a part of our inheritance. And I think that like, if we look back on the church's history, there are times when the church has been at her best, when like, we were leading the world in innovation, in, in the arts, in science, um, in, uh, we, we, I mean, if you look at the university systems, hospital systems, music notation, like all that stuff it's in the all video. all the Catholic intellectual tradition. Yeah, that came out of the Catholic intellectual tradition. And it's not just something for certain types of professionals. Like, I believe that every single one of us has the God-given ability to create and has a call to create just in, in, in your own way. So with that in mind, like, why are we not there as a church now? It's, I think, in a lot of ways, it's because, like, we've lost, we've lost that culture. It's not, it's not something that, like, is just a part of how we do things. And in order for us to get to a place where, like, we, we have uh, a culture that is outputting ideas like Molly's all the time, like, we need to be investing in young people. We need to be teaching creative skill sets. We need to be just like showing people that it's possible, connecting them with each other. There needs to be networks, coaches. And so that's like really my dream for Catholic Creatives that we create the fabric, the network for, for ideas to, to, to kind of like come to fruition. So OSV, um, they saw what we were doing with, we were putting on regional events around the U.S., putting out these kind Can of- Can you define OSV for yeah, people sure. that don't know what that is? Our Sunday, Our Sunday Visitor, Visitor Institute. So they are a, um, yeah, they're just one of the big, uh, big organizations in the Catholic Church. They give away like $7 million a year in grants. Um, and uh, so they, they were just having really crappy ideas coming their way in the last like few years. They're just like, this is the same 10 ideas that we had last year. Who, who should we talk to about this, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, somehow they got in touch with us and they were like, we really love what you're, you, you guys were doing. We were thinking about doing the same thing. Let's just partner together to do this thing. So now we're building basically like a Y Combinator for Catholic initiatives. Um, we're doing that through our regional events. And at the end of the uh, end of the year, we're going to be, or yeah, in May, we'll have our Catholic Creative Summit. And at that summit, we'll be uh, judging five ideas, and uh, three of them will be getting gifts of $100,000. No strings attached, just to pursue their idea. 
That's great. Yeah, how many summits are you doing a year? Yeah, so our summit is like once a year. Once but a year, we have, okay. You know, like five to ten summit. regional events. Every regional week. events that lead up to into yeah. that. Mm -hmm. And then um, quickly, tell us about Eight Beats. Yeah, so this is actually another thing that came this out of really the first cool. the first summit, but um, we had like a whole group of filmmakers at our first summit that just you know they had all been working in different uh, different areas. Some were in commercial work, some were filmmakers, um, and they at our first summit they got together and they're like, we want to do something together. Like, how could we use this network to just do something amazing? So they decided to split into eight different groups and uh, basically like create a, uh, a, a film that's like eight short films on the eight Beatitudes. Some of you guys might be familiar if you're like really into film, might be familiar with the Decalogue, but it's a sort of like, uh, it's fine, different crowd, different crowd. <laughs> <laughs> but the point was like, we, we've raised, uh, we raised $100,000 for each of them through the community to each go and do their own film. Um, and each of those films now has been accepted into, like, I mean, the list is insane. Up to 20, 30 different, uh, uh, different film festivals around the world. So the project is almost done. One of the films isn't done yet, so it's not public. But um, they're really incredible works. We've been contacted by, like, some pretty big organizations about possibly buying it. So a lot of things in the works still there, but you can take a look at it, 8beatsmovie.com. So. Um, I know the students might ask this too, but yeah. they just go on the, if they want to get involved, Yeah. They, they go on the website. Okay, so two things. Go to calcreatives.com, go to osvchallenge.com. Uh, OSV Challenge, open for business, guys. I want every single one of you to put in an idea. Uh, you have <laughs> until the end of the month. Oh, so <laughs> you mean you mean November thirtieth? Yeah. Yeah. So not okay. that much time. Yeah, and it's not a busy time in the semester, so I'm sure they're not they're at all. Okay. But it's the first part of the application is super simple. It's just like a couple a couple paragraphs. What's your idea? Why can you do it? And um, just come meet with me. I'm kind of in charge of the first round, so I might be able to help you guys like get through it. <laughs> After Boston that, College. I can't help. <laughs> um, anyway, but. Point being, though, like, you guys all have something to offer, I'm sure. So come up with something. Secondly, Catholic Creatives as a network, we have a, uh, we have a Slack channel and a Facebook group, and we also have regional events around the U.S. and our summit. So we'd love to get you guys an invite to those things. Just um, hit up that, the website, and we'll, you know, we'll get you linked in. I want to um, go back to Molly in two seconds, but... Um Nell, let's take a quick peek at the retreats because I think maybe students might be interested in that or, or down the road. And then let's talk about Blessed Is She for College Students, which has just been born, literally. I don't see Boston on that list. Ah. Oh. But there's an opportunity <laughs> down the road, maybe. I mean, perhaps. I'm all about it. <laughs> So every year we pick different locations based on those regional groups. So we have that country cut up, right? We have the Northwest, the Southwest, Southern, Northeast, and Midwest. So these were the retreats this year, and we were in Ireland for two weekends. Actually, Beth Davis, our Director of Ministry Advancement, Director for Ministry Advancement, is in Ireland right now. They're having their second weekend of the Dublin retreats. And if you're interested for 2020... 2020, 2020, what is this woman old? Uh, Restore is a theme for our next line of retreats, and it's on the website. We have two confirmed locations. We have Washington, D.C. and Phoenix, and then we'll flesh out the rest as we get them. But the retreat itself is a really unusual experience. For people who've gone on retreats, you know, you show up for that day, and you get your badge, and you get your bag, and you find somebody to sit by, and then someone's talking, and... The, the Bus and She Retreat is a, it's a whole 12-hour period. So there's an evening before on Friday, and it's all day on Saturday. And the talks are written really closely in connection with one another, so they really flow. It's not like going to a seminar or a conference where you might hear a little of this and a little of that. The theme is cohesive. The aesthetics are beautiful. We really want the women to be able to enter in and connect. You get a prayer partner. You're seated at tables with one another. There's time for the introverts, don't worry. 
but you get a chance to meet each other, to hear beautiful talks. We have mass, we have confessions, we have adoration. And the adoration, something really special about it is that it's an adoration procession. It's a Eucharistic procession. So the priest brings our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament and the monstrance to each and every woman at the retreat. And if you think you're not going to cry, you should have seen me on my first retreat. I'm in the back like sobbing, being like, I wasn't going to cry. It's an incredibly moving experience. And you walk away feeling like I've connected with other women. I've found time for myself and my relationship with God. I've heard incredible talks like talks that sister here has given. And you feel invigorated. You feel like you can go on to face the normal things in life when you've had that time apart. You know, I, I want to say that Blessed is She is bringing young people back to the church. I know that for sure. And also, I think it's important to mention, um, I, I don't want young people to feel like they have to know everything there is about our religion to be invited into this community. You can know nothing and be open. I mean, I'm not a theologian, you guys. We do have a theological editor who checks our stuff, but I'm a lawyer. I'm a, I'm a mom. And when we look at our materials and our materials we have for groups to get together, it's very invitational, and it's me and you where we are. I say we because I'm included in that. And just last week, I met with young women from Notre Dame who wanted to talk about how do we bring Blessed is She to our campus? Yeah, there are people doing the studies in the dorms. Now, people we, d we don't talk about Notre Dame here. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> it's this unknown school yes. where they have a touchdown Jesus statue. That's right. That's right. So listening to their, their request that we've heard time and time again throughout the years, how can we do this on our campus? How can we bring this to our campus in, in a bigger format, not just the pockets of women meeting together? So as Karen said, as of yesterday on our website, we have a special link for Blessed to She College groups and a specific gathering guide, a leadership guide for women in college. It's a transitional period of your lives, right? You've flown the coop. You're like, you've, you've individuated from your folks, but you're also learning to flourish in your faith and having it be your own faith. And we want to help people come together authentically and vulnerably and grow in their faith together through these beautiful years of college. And we do need a blessed is he at some point. So we need some men out there to start that. But that's, we'll pray for, we'll pray for that. Hey, buddy. Where's Don't Selena? submit that idea. <laughs> Oh, ho, ho. <laughs> too funny. Molly, Take a little deeper. <laughs> yeah. Molly, let's get back to you. Talk to us a little bit more about um, what's happening now and what's happening with the project in the next year. And can young people get involved? And you're going to need a big tribe to accomplish. I mean, you're, you're, you're rocking the world with mapping. Um, so how can how can young people get involved? How can we support you? I guess um, it's been a really interesting progress because our work is very technical. I like to compare it to building a hospital. There's a lot of great environmental reflection groups out there. There's a lot of environmental education in the Catholic Church, but there really isn't a solutions-oriented environmental group. And what I've said over and over again is that it's not just... Um, it can't just serve Catholics. So we've been having to make something that isn't just innovative within the Catholic Church, but actually innovative in all markets and really competitive in that sense. So that's that's been huge. Exciting, and, though. Yes. And the last three years have been really focused on um, foundational data development with our private sector partners at like Esri, with the students at Yale through student projects. So we've been kind of these data accumulators up until now and doing these individual projects. Um, this next year, I'm a, the young champion representing North America for the United Nations for environmental programs. So um, I, I have a small grant, so we're actually hiring a social media manager um, part-time. That's part of the grant that was allocated. Um, we're going to be, we're really focused right now on fundraising and expanding. You kind of, when you start an organization, it's going to like, blah. <laughs> I guess that's the right. best way to explain it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you first start. But then you get, you know, we have to have, and we do have, from pro bono support, a lot of legal infrastructure, a lot of technical infrastructure. We have to hire scientists. We have to, I contract a lot of technologists. These jobs aren't free, and they aren't student work. They're professionals. They're like the doctors. You know, you can't just They're go expensive. on They're expensive. They are. Um, so we've kind of grown from the blah 
to like being this gaggle of contractors and me and other kind of administrative support. And over the next year, we're really focused on increasing our capacity. So that means actually hiring a full-time staff. And um, how we actually do that and the financial vehicles have been kind of interesting and modular to this point. So we are a social enterprise. I mean, we are a nonprofit, but something that I find incredibly fascinating here is all of us have a revenue generating stream. And I think that comes with the territory of innovation because it takes a lot of time for people to buy in. And you know, the modern structures of funding out there, the grant cycles, they aren't kind of timed with innovation. Um, you know, Absolutely. the kind Just of- Just the writing of them alone and then submitting and then waiting and waiting and waiting. It's, uh, I mean, I'm okay writing them, but yeah. The waiting, <laughs> yeah. The waiting part takes, yeah. it makes you grow in holiness a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I think, you know, it's, it's interesting to see how as young Catholics, we've kind of broken this ground and I think as we walk on new ground, like as we grow, as Goodlands grows in its impact. So we've been, like I said too, that we started begging people to do work for free and now we're getting more requests than we can handle, you know? And once we kind of hit that capacity where we can really say yes to some of the bigger projects, which I'm very excited about, um, you know, it's really, um, it's seeing where it goes. And I think, you know, Catholic innovation, we're, we're pushing new ground in not just creativity and design and reflection, you know, I would say there's an element of design in all our work from the internal Definitely. to the communications to the property, you know, um, it, we're gonna see just a shift in how, how things can be approached because we've all discovered the old models aren't sustainable um, for the kind of supporting the kind of work that we're doing. Um, I don't know if that answers yeah. your question. Uh, um, I'm curious before we, we turn the program over to the uh, audience, um, what do you wish you knew back then that you know now? And that's for all three of you. Like to first? Yeah, I guess since, um, I guess. Because it's, it's not an easy journey. Yeah, I mean, there I must be days you wake up and you're like, what have I done? I'm in so deep now. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, I guess I wish I, wish I had known my faith has definitely gotten stronger. Mm. I really Beautiful. wish I had known to not sweat the small stuff and not sweat the medium stuff and just sweat the large stuff a little bit um, <laughs> <laughs> because you're sweating all the time. I mean, <laughs> you know, there's always a typo. I mean, when you have to send 100 emails a day, you're bound to not be perfect. I remember the first time when I started Goodland, so um, I was right out of a 10-month master's program. I took seven hours to write each professional email to like a really high power person that I followed up with. Yeah. And I would have three editors looking at them and I would cry if I had a typo. And now, now I write letters to the Pope with only one editor. <laughs> 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 but <laughs> maybe I should be more relaxed, <laughs> not relaxed, I don't know. Uh -huh. But yeah, you're, you're just, I think um, it's not even confidence. You still feel, you still get, you know, annoyed with yourself and right. you still- But you're doing so much, you know, yeah, and, and you trying learn. to keep up and- just you you're learning like you shouldn't be afraid to uh, you should be afraid to mess up big time but you shouldn't be afraid to mess up on these little things that can really damage your confidence and even messing up big time you know so <laughs> pick yourself back up that's where our faith comes in right yeah a yeah. lot of faith a lot and a lot of tears you know and i think you are gonna mess up big time i guess it sort of depends on what you mean by that right like yeah. what level is big time i yeah. i mean for me like i've if you start something, it's because you care about it so freaking much and nobody else cares about it the way you care about it. And every time that you talk to somebody and they don't get it, you're like so frustrated and like you get stirred up. And, you know, it, I think that there's there's something in each of us that's like the orphan that just doesn't believe that there's enough out there that doesn't believe that um, anybody's going to take you seriously, that you're going to have to prove yourself to every single person that you're around, that your idea is worth it, that you're worth it. And I think for me, like, the process of starting Catholic Creatives, literally every four months, it's a make or break it moment where I'm like, oh my God, I'm having to ante up again. This isn't going to work. Like, we're going to, everything's falling apart. Um, I remember, I mean, when we launched the ticket sales to the first summit, nobody, we didn't have, like we, we took some images from like other conferences and put a filter over them. We're like, our conference is gonna be this cool, guys. 
you know, like it was such. And a, no one has signed up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I it was I like we put the down payment down on the space. It was like the first time I ever wrote like a twenty thousand dollar check, and I was like, oh my god, this is, I don't know, you know, like what if nobody buys a ticket? It it like that journey though. It's not a journey so much of like outward success. Like what I wish I'd known at the time is like the whole thing is about your relationship with God. That's right. And this is like yep. his way of teaching you how to trust him. Every new step. It's like that new place where you have to go to the Lord and just be like, wow, <laughs> I don't know if you're going to come through right now. You know, like I've cried a lot, guys. Yeah. I've cried a lot. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Along those lines, I think I wish I, I wish I had known all those years ago that when you really love something and you're pouring yourself into it, God will multiply your time. Because it always has felt like we have more ideas coming out of our minds and like more texts going back and forth between Jen and I than like anybody else. Like constant rapid fire. Oh my gosh, can we do this? Can we do that? And feeling f- kind of frustrated and like thwarted. Oh, I don't have the time. And maybe for other people, I don't have the resources. How, how am I going to make this happen? I have so many ideas. And I wish I had known then that if we do, if we rightly order our lives and we do the things that we need to do, God will multiply the time. I mean, my little kiddos, like, go through my day. I, like, do the dishes after breakfast, and I change them for the laundry, and then we read some books, and we do some things, and I put them down for quiet time, and I'm like, Lord, you better multiply the time. <laughs> they better stay put, and nobody have an accident so I can get these emails out <laughs> real fast, not seven hours, Molly. It's like, ah, seven yeah. minutes. But realizing, okay, Lord, I'm going to put you first in my life. I'm going to trust in you, like you said. And I'm going to do the things I have to do to be, I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to nourish myself. I'm going to try to exercise my body. I'm going to try to drink enough water. I'm going to try to call my mom. Do all those things, right? And he will multiply the time. So not to feel frantic and frenetic when we can't get to, scrambling to get to the things that I want to get to, but trusting that like, if I weren't, if if I didn't get to it today, it's not the end of the world. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to like regenerate my cellular level and then come back at it again tomorrow. Yeah. Good takeaway. Good takeaway. So normally our programs are over in like 45 minutes, but here we are like almost an hour and a half. Yikes. Sorry. Thanks for hanging with us. Um, It does speak to the three of you and what you're doing. And we could be here all night. And so thank you for taking trains, literally trains, planes, and automobiles to be with us tonight. Um, We hope that you'll find a friendship at Boston College and that we can continue the conversation that students feel like they can be in touch with you. We will pray for you. We applaud you. We need you. So, and we hope to get you back here to BC. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you to all of you for coming. Really appreciate it. Have a good night and stay warm.